Hello, I'm Brendan Wong and you're watching Nightline. Top stories. No need for special day one right yet sitting on Monday, March the 2nd, says Yang Diputuanagung. And Malaysia imposes travel ban on visitors from parts of South Korea. Yang di Pertuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Billah Shah consented the decision made by Dewan Rakyat Speaker to not call for a special parliamentary sitting this March the 2nd. This was relayed in a statement on Friday by the Comptroller of the Royal Household, Datu Ahmad Fadli Shamsuddin. According to Datu Ahmad Fadli, the King would continue with efforts to find a solution in line with the federal constitution in the best interest of the Rakyat and the country. The statement added that Istana Negara will instead call leaders of political parties with representation in the Dewan Rakyat to give them an opportunity to nominate a member of parliament as prime minister. Al Sultan Abdullah also expressed his gratitude to all members of parliament, chief secretary to the government, and all those involved in the two day one on one interview sessions, which began on Tuesday, February the 25th. Based on the interview sessions, the young Dipertuan Agong has yet to ascertain any member of parliament who commands the majority support of the federal lawmakers to form a new government. Earlier on Friday, state rulers also gathered at Istana Negara for a special meeting to formulate a resolution to the country's political crisis following the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government on Monday. The ongoing turmoil has brought to the fore the crucial role played by the institution of the Yang Dipertuan Agung and the Malay rulers to stabilize the political situation in the country. Bersatu President Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin may be on his way to becoming the country's eighth Prime Minister. This, as the Pago Member of Parliament, has been named as candidate for the post by not only his party, but also MPs from Barisa National and PAS. This came after the political parties issued separate statements on Friday, declaring their support for Tan Sri Muhyiddin following Istana Negara's announcement that it will allow the lawmakers to nominate their candidate. Earlier, Bersatu issued a statement saying all its 26 MPs, as well as 10 MPs aligned with sacked PKR leader Datusri Azmin Ali, will support Tan Sri Muhyiddin as the Prime Minister candidate. Hours later, PAS and BN also confirmed that all their 60 MPs would back the Bersatu president, which meant that Tan Sri Muhyiddin now has the support of at least 96 MPs. It is believed that Gabungan Parti Sarawak GPS and Parti Warisan Sabah will also be throwing their support for Tan Sri Muhyiddin. Should Warisan confirm its support, Tan Sri Muhyiddin would have 105 MPs out of 222 behind him. Meanwhile, the Pakatan Harapan Presidential Council on Friday claimed that PKR President Datustri Anwar Ibrahim has the support of the majority of the 222 MPs in the Dewan Rakyat. The PH Presidential Council in a statement said it believed that Datustri Anwar should be given the opportunity to have an audience with the young Dipertuan Agung Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Bilal Shah to prove that he has the confidence of the majority of the MPs. The statement comes in the midst of the political upheaval over the impasse on the appointment of the next Prime Minister. Interim Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad was supposed to have passed the Premiership to Datuk Sri Anwar in accordance with the agreement by the Pakatan Presidential Council prior to the last general election. However, upon the resignation of Tun Dr. Mahathir on February the 24th and the exit of Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia from the ruling Pakatan coalition, the government collapsed. In the meantime, Sarawak's ruling PAC GPS has said it will announce its decision on Sunday. Whoever gains GPS support will have the majority support of the lower house and can form the government. GPS, which has 18 MPs, is the biggest bloc that has yet to announce its stance and whose votes will decide who becomes the next Prime Minister.
Venus Assemblyman Datu Hasni Muhammad of Amno has been sworn in as the 18th Johor Menteri Besar. The swearing-in ceremony was held at Istana Bukit Serene before the Sultan of Johor, Sultan Ibrahim Sultan Iskandar, at 5.09 p.m. on Friday. Also present was Tunku Makota Johor, Tunku Ismail Sultan Ibrahim. 61-year-old Datu Hasni, who is... Ba Johor Barisan National BN Chairman and State Amno Chief was picked as the new Menteri Bisa following the formation of the Gabungan Baharu Coalition Government comprising Amno, PAS and Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia Bersatu. Datu Hasni and the third MB to be appointed in Johor in three years after the 14th Jadu election and replaces Datu Sharudin Jamal of Bersatu who was appointed MB on April the 14th last year. On Wednesday, the Sultan interviewed 54 of the assemblymen to find out their position on who they wanted as the new MB after Bersatu pulled out of the PH coalition on Monday, which led Johor with a hung state government. Malaysia has imposed a temporary ban on visitors from South Korea, including other foreign nationals who have visited Daegu and Chungdo the two locations which have seen a rise in confirmed COVID-19 cases. The health ministry in a statement on Friday said the ban, effective immediately, also applies to visitors transiting in Malaysia. Malaysian nationals, permanent residents and holders of student passes and long-term social visit passes who have also been in the two locations during a 14-day period before arriving in Malaysia will need to undergo health screening. Immigration authorities will also set up special counters for visitors from South Korea, Japan, Italy and Iran as part of measures to heighten screening undertaken at international entry points into Malaysia. Besides China, Malaysians are now being advised to defer travel to areas affected by the COVID-19 outbreak in those four countries. South Korea has reported more than 500 new cases and one death in 24 hours, bringing the national total to 1,766 cases and 13 deaths. In another development, Health Director General Dr. Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah said two new COVID-19 cases were reported on Friday, this time involving a 41-year-old Japanese woman and a 54-year-old Italian man. The woman, who is working in the country, had reportedly visited Japan in January and then Indonesia earlier this month. The Italian man, who is married to a local and resides in Malaysia, had traveled to Italy for work matters from February the 15th to the 21st. They are now receiving treatment at an isolation ward at Kuala Lumpur and Sungai Bulu hospitals. With the new cases, Malaysia now has a total of 25 confirmed cases. Of the number, 22 have recovered and have been discharged. Meanwhile, at least 800 Malaysian pilgrims are stranded in Jeddah and Medina after the Saudi Arabian government banned outbound and inbound flights as part of measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. A Malaysian pilgrim who is currently in Medina said he was supposed to board a 10 p.m. flight on Thursday, but his flight got cancelled. 28-year-old Azmir Muhammad and his group were scheduled to arrive at KL International Airport, KLIA, at 12.55 p.m. on Friday. He also said there was no official statement by the airline on the matter and many of them had to seek information from other sources. It was reported that more than 100 Malaysian and Indonesian Umrah pilgrims were also stranded at KLIA. This includes 39 pilgrims from Kedah and 23 Indonesian pilgrims from Makassar who were on transit at the airport before boarding a flight to Saudi Arabia. Wisma Putra has also advised Malaysians to delay their travel to Saudi Arabia for pilgrimage or tourism purposes. Santri Tommy Thomas has tendered his resignation as Attorney General as Malaysia gets set for a new Prime Minister. According to a source, Santri Thomas reportedly submitted his resignation letter to Tun Dr. Mahathir, who appointed him to the post for a two-year term, which was due to end only in June. His appointment as AG had initially sparked resistance, questioning his race and concerns that he would not uphold the special privileges of the Malays and Bumiputra, as well as Islam as the religion of the country. His departure would also spell uncertainties for the ongoing cases. He currently handles 27 high-profile cases at the High Court and Sessions Court in Kuala Lumpur and Shah Alam. Just in case I'm 
Then Dr. Mahathir Mohammad on Friday lambasted powerful nations for their resilience and silence over the prolonged Israeli war crimes on Palestinian land. In expressing his anger towards such atrocities, the interim prime minister said suffering of the Palestinian people persists despite demands for justice against the oppression. Tun Dr. Mahathir also urged ASEAN member states to continue the pursuit of justice and peace for the oppressed. Our collective voice regionally should espouse more than just economic development. We should also extend a united front in supporting the rights of the Palestinian people. This is the primary purpose of this peace conference. Tun Dr. Mahathir said this in his keynote address at an international conference on Palestine in Kuala Lumpur on Friday. He said all platforms available, both ASEAN and non-ASEAN, should be used to continue voicing concerns and registering outrage over the inhumane and barbaric acts that the Tel Aviv regime had inflicted on the Palestinians. In his speech, Tun Dr. Mahathir again condemned the so-called deal of the century peace plan proposed by the United States to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Kuala Lumpur High Court on Friday dismissed Dr. Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak's application for a stay of proceedings of the Inland Revenue Board suit seeking the former Prime Minister to pay 1.69 billion ringgit in income tax pending an appeal on the tax assessment of the IRB. Judge Datu Ahmad Bachir ruled that it was quite premature to stay proceedings at an early stage as there was no judgment by the court. In his ruling, the judge said the substantial amount of claim did not constitute a special circumstance. The stay would, if granted, defeat the whole substratum of the tax recovery legislation as manifested in Section 103 of the Income Tax Act 1967. The judge said the court opined that the defendant's fear of losing was mere speculative and without lawful basis. The judge also said that the former Prime Minister had not shown any cogent evidence to prove the IRB's inability to compensate. On August 8 last year, Dr. Sri Najib filed an application for a stay of proceedings of the IRB suit seeking him to pay 1.69 billion ringgit in income tax, pending an appeal on the tax assessment by the IRB. However, the IRB in its supporting affidavit said that Dr. Sri Najib still had to pay the total amount of 1.69 billion ringgit even if he had filed an appeal against the tax assessment. Media Prima Burhad has announced the appointment of Datu Iskandar Mizal Mahmud as Group Managing Director effective April 1, 2020. Media Prima in a statement on Friday said Datu Iskandar replaces Datu Kamal Khalid, who will end his tenure on March 31, 2020. Datuk Iskandar joined Media Prima on October 1, 2019 as Group Executive Director. He has over 30 years of experience with several companies, ranging from multinationals to government-linked companies, spanning from investment banking to the technology sector. Datuk Iskandar graduated from Boston University, the United States of America, with a Bachelor of Science and Business Administration majoring in accountancy. The statement also said Datuk Kamal has served the group in multiple capacities since 2009. He played a pivotal role in completing the first phase of the group's business transformation efforts, Odyssey, which focused on revenue diversification across three key areas, digital, commerce and going beyond Malaysia. Still to come, Nightline's also segment. Now for Nightline's auto segment. Honda Malaysia recently launched the all-new 10th generation Honda Accord along with a facelift for the new Honda Civic. Both cars are completely knocked down CKD models that are fully assembled locally at Honda Malaysia's manufacturing plant in Alo Gajah, Malacca. One Izul Islam finds out more.
Welcome to the auto segment with me, One is Islam. So for this week's segment, let me introduce to you to Honda's latest addition to the family, the all-new Accord, as well as the new Civic. These two cars are basically the best or the benchmark cars for the, both the C and D segments with premium features, dynamic performance, as well as elegance. Let's go find out more. Honda's new flagship executive saloon, the Accord, has an overall wider body with a wider stance, lower roofline and longer hood, highlighting a sleeker and classier posture. A unique new feature on the all-new Accord is its 18-inch alloy wheels with built-in resonator that is specially designed to reduce tyre noise. It is also the first Japanese mass-market vehicle to be equipped with a turbocharged engine in the D-segment sedan class. Now let's take a look under the hood of the all-new Accord. As you can see here, it is equipped with an enhanced 1.5-litre turbocharged VTEC engine. Now this engine can generate power of 201 PS with 216 newton meters of torque, which is more powerful than a 2.4 liter engine. It promises, of course, greater fuel efficiency with, of course, even distribution of power. Awarded a five-star ASEAN NCAP safety rating, the all-new Accord offers comprehensive safety technology with a full suite of Honda sensing. This comprises eight features including low speed follow, auto high beam, adaptive cruise control, collision mitigation braking system, along with forward collision warning, lane keep assist system, road departure mitigation and lane departure warning. The interior cabin has been upgraded with a four-way assistant power seat with a shoulder switch, wireless charger, driver attention monitor and a central 8-inch advanced entertainment console. It is also equipped with a 7-inch interactive TFT meter cluster, smart parking assist system with rear brake assist, multi-view 360-degree camera system and an electric parking brake. On the road without insurance, the all-new Accord is priced at 185,900 ringgit for the 1.5 TC variant and 195,900 ringgit for the 1.5 TCP variant. The color choices are crystal black pearl, lunar silver metallic, modern steel metallic and a brand new color, platinum white pearl. Malaysia's C-segment leader, the Honda Civic, has been given a facelift along with Honda's next-generation advanced safety technology. It is the first Japanese locally mass-produced C-segment model to be offered with the full suite of Honda Sensing advanced safety features. The Civic now also comes with Honda Lane Watch, a camera-based safety technology that supplements the side mirror and enhances the side view. The new Honda Civic, apart from the upgraded interior design which maximizes comfortability of the car, it is also the first C-segment car equipped with Honda Sensing Safety Technology. What is that? We've got of course the all-new Lane Watch, which allows the car to move from lanes without you having to look to the blind spot. On the exterior, the Civic is further refined to enhance its fastback styling charm and is fitted with a new front bumper, delivering a bolder look along with a new rear bumper garnish and new boot spoiler. Furthermore, the new 18-inch black alloy wheels complete its overall low and wide stance dynamic presence. Powered by a 1.5-litre VTEC turbocharged engine, the C-segment leader now offers D-segment features such as new leather seat ascent design. Another new feature of the Civic includes a 60-40 split rear seat configuration, maximizing cargo space. All variants of the new Civic are equipped with top-class safety features such as six airbags, vehicle stability, agile handle and hill start assist, along with new front sensors. 
three variants are offered, with the 1.8S starting at 113,600 ringgit, the 1.5 TC variant priced at 129,600 ringgit, and the 1.5 TCP variant at 139,600 ringgit. Customers can choose between five different colors, including passion red pearl, lunar silver metallic, white orchid pearl, modern steel metallic, and crystal black pearl. One is Al Islam for Seven Edition. COVID-19 cases ease down in China. More on this when we return. On to the foreign front. China reported 44 more new deaths from the COVID-19 epidemic on Friday, bringing the death toll to nearly 2,800. The number of fatalities, which is up from the 29 reported on Thursday, were all in the Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak, except for two deaths in Beijing. According to the National Health Commission, there were 327 new confirmed cases, down from 433 cases a day earlier and the lowest daily figure in more than a month. In total, 78,824 people have now been infected with the novel coronavirus in the mainland. The general decline in new infections in China comes as infections in other countries gather pace, with the World Health Organization warning that the coronavirus epidemic was at a decisive point. <laughs> Meanwhile, South Korea reported 256 new coronavirus cases on Friday, bringing the total number of infected in the country to 2,022. Vice Health Minister Kim Kang Lip said of the new cases, 182 were in the southeastern city of Daegu, the location of the church at the center of South Korea's outbreak. Meanwhile, the death toll from the virus stood at 13, unchanged from the day earlier. In the meantime, around 1,000 people were in quarantine in Germany's most populous state Friday, as the number of confirmed cases of novel coronavirus in Europe's biggest economy rose to above 50. The district of Heinsberg in North Rhine-Westphalia said it had to take the step of keeping around 1,000 home as an infected couple had participated in carnival celebrations in mid-February. Schools and kindergartens were also shut in the district until Monday, as the number of cases linked to the cluster reached 20. Turkey on Friday vowed to retaliate, retaliate over an airstrike from a Russian-backed Syrian government that killed 33 of its troops in northwestern Syria, the highest number of Turkish soldiers killed in a single day since Ankara first intervened in the Syrian conflict in 2016. According to Turkish officials in a statement, the soldiers were targeted in an area between the villages of Bara and Balyun in the southern Idlib countryside. Russia, which is providing military support to the Syrian regime, meanwhile, denied that they intentionally targeted the Turkish soldiers, who were operating alongside the rebel fighters in the area during the attacks. It also said that Ankara had failed to inform them about the presence of the Turkish troops at the scene. The airstrike came after Turkey-backed Syrian opposition fighters retook a strategic northwestern town from government forces on Thursday, cutting a key highway just days after the government reopened it for the first time since 2012.
And before we wrap up Nightline, let's take a look at what has been installed on the front pages of Malaysia's main newspapers on Saturday, February the 29th. All three newspapers, the New Straits Times, Berita Harian and Harian Metro, focus on the current political crisis and the race for support from 222 MPs as the choice for PM narrowed down to two candidates. Be among the first to get your copies. In Georgia, Nico Piramani's artwork has been given a modern twist in an exhibition at the new Tbilisi's Holoseum, as it were brought to life with the use of 120 projectors to give visitors a chance to interact with the artworks. Let's take a look. I'm Brendan Wong. Thanks for tuning in and good night.